Hello everyone, and I'm back with another poem by Sujata Mehta. Uh, another poem that is marked by, or that is titled in terms of its date, uh, but very different from the poem that we have done earlier, that is 29th April 1984. If you want uh, to know more, or if you haven't seen that video, maybe you can go and have a look at that uh, video uh, on 29th April 1984. These poems by Sujata Mehta. Sujata Mehta is an important writer, Indian diasporic writer, who has lived in India and also in Europe, in Germany. And uh, she figures prominently in the curriculums uh, dealing with diasporic literature, A-levels, and so on. So I'm doing some of the main poems or some of the important poems that figure repeatedly in various curriculums uh, that have been written by Sujata Mehta. So uh, after 29th April, that was the first poem I did. Uh, I'm going to work, uh, I'm going to discuss 3rd November, 1984. And then subsequently, I'm going to discuss more poems by the author. So let's go on uh, to the poem directly. So as I mentioned earlier, the poem is marked by or the poem is titled in terms of its uh, date of composition, right? The poem is written on 3rd November 1984. Now, what is special about these poems that have been titled in terms of the dates uh, of their composition is that the subject of these poems ha is, is some event of significance in the life of the poet. The poem 19, uh, 29th April 1989 was deeply personal. It was, it marked the day her daughter turned three months. It is. A, it was a poem that shows a brief moment of respite, of, of love in the, the life and the routine of a mother. Now this, it is about her personal life, that poem. Now this is also a personal poem. 3rd November 1984, I would call it a personal poem, but it is written in response to a public event. The anti-Sikh riots that rocked India, particularly cities like Delhi, in 1984. Now, what happened? What were what were these anti-Sikh riots, or what happened that led to them? So, it was a horribly tragic time uh, in India. On 31st October 1984, India's then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was assassinated by her Sikh bodyguards. This led to widespread hate and violence on the streets and the Sikh, Sikh community was particularly targeted in during those uh, days, during the weeks following the assassination. Now there were horrifying, horrifying images of riots, people being killed, fire, arson, and these were captured worldwide in the newspapers at the time. So these riots, uh, immediately following the assassination of the Prime Minister, India's then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, these, the poem, that is the context of this poem. It is, po it is the poet's response to the event, a response that is drawn out from her own emotions, from her memories. It is a poem that is, and it is a poem that is not supposed to be, right? It was, it is a poem that is that she did not want to write and we as you go on you will you know she keeps on saying that she does not want to write this poem it ends up but she ends up doing it she ends up writing this poem so why does it why does she do that why does this happen so in a way this poem i would say is also a kind of a mediation a deliberation on the links between art like a poem and history that art even if it even when it tries to detach itself from history from the tragedies of history cannot help but respond to history the poet however much she tries she cannot image she cannot escape the images in the newspaper and these images evoke and intermingle with the images of her past whatever she's trying to write she cannot you know these images this news permeates uh, intrudes in her consciousness so that she ends up writing about the poem. It also conjures up her images from her memory where she recalls her friends, Sikhs and Hindus and how they used to live and play together. And this is in direct contrast to the events during the riots. 
So in that sense, the poem is a personal poem to re uh, responding to an, a tragic historical event. It is also a mediation on the relationship between art and history where art, even if it tries to detach itself, even if it tries to escape the tragedies of history, even in its denial, it is a response to history. Okay, so we can move with the poem as you can see. Uh, okay, uh, just give me, I think I need to rearrange this so that you can see the whole, whole poem, which I will do in a minute. But just to give you an idea of the structure of the poem before we begin, it is a free verse poem. We do not really see any rhyme or rhythm patterns. The lines are uneven. So it is a free verse poem written in irregular five stanzas. So the five stanzas here, one, two, three, four, five. So five stanzas, irregular, free verse. The tone is very conversational and personal, right? Notice the use of I. So it is it is a poem, poet talking directly to the uh, reader. So conversational and personal style. So I hope you can see the poem, the entire uh, poem now. So let's start with the poem. I won't buy the New York Times today. I can't, I'm sorry. But when I walk into the uh, bookstore, I can't help reading the front page. And I stare at the photographs of dead men and women. I know I have seen alive. So it begins with a negative, I won't buy it. Begins with an assertion that she would not buy the New York Times, the newspaper today. It begins with a denial, a rejection of the events. And she says in this short sentence marked with a caesura here, I can't, I'm sorry. It's like she apologizing. She's apologizing from turning away. She, she's, she's, it's, it's, you know, as an aware citizen, it is her responsibility as a poet, as a public figure, it is her responsibility to be aware, to uh, respond to the event. And she's apologizing. She, she, because maybe she thinks she would be blamed for being escapist, for lacking sympathy. But she says she apologizes right at the start. She expresses her inability right? Her inability. I can't. I'm sorry. It is beyond her. It is beyond her sphere of capabilities. You know, she is, she cannot buy it. She cannot read. She's sorry. Right at the start. The present tense, notice the use of present tense, which gives a sense of urgency. So she says she won't buy the newspaper, but there is a turn here in the paragraph, uh, in the stanza, but when I walk into the bookstore, I can't help reading the front page. So she cannot escape. The news is everywhere. She can't help but see the images. And these images hold her in a thrall, right? Uh, they hold her captive. I can't help reading the front page and I stare at the photographs. So she does not, she cannot turn once she, the images are there, she cannot turn her eyes away. I stare at the photographs. She has to stand and stare. So she cannot escape them. They hold her captive. Also notice the use of enjambment in these lines. Uh, uh, not, But when I walk into the bookstore, I can't help reading the front page and I stare at the photographs of the dead men and women. I know I have seen alive. The enjambment, the line continues through, uh, the sentence continues through uh, these six, uh, five lines, right? Uh, it is enjambment is is a very it is a very good way. It signifies disruption of the line, disruption of the. But I don't want to look. But I have to look. You know these abrupt thoughts. So she don't, doesn't want to. But at the same time she can't help it. So it is that disruption and continuity of thought or of action. It almost mirrors the state of the author. So in the, the poetic technique of enjambment mirrors the state of the author who tries to deny, who tries to turn away, but continues to stare at the pictures, right? So as of dead men and women, I know I have seen alive. So she says, I know in the insistence that she has seen them alive. Is it the same men and women? Maybe not really the same people, but these are the people that she has grown up with.
They remind her of the people that she has grown up with. So I know I've seen them alive in the sense it's not literal that the newspapers carry the, uh, the images of men or women she has seen alive, but more so like she has grown up with the same people living together. So again, coming back to the next uh, stanza, the, ne the denial continues, the rejection continues. And today, of urgency here and now. Today, I don't want to think of Hindus cutting open Sikhs and Sikhs cutting open Hindus and Hindus cutting open and the line does not end. There is no full stop. It's like a cycle of violence that has been unleashed on the, in, the, in the streets of uh, Delhi of India at that time in 1984. So uh, Hindus attacking Sikhs and Sikhs responding and attacking Hindus and Hindus in turn responding. So it's like a cycle of violence uh, that the riot is. And she doesn't want to think about, but the repetition shows this repetition, you know, Hindus cutting open Sikhs and Sikhs cutting open Hindus and Hindus cutting, this repetition shows that she ends up thinking about it. She just ends up thinking about the same thing that she has been trying to deny. Just like she could not escape the pictures in the outside world, she cannot escape her thoughts, her memories. Uh, these are, as she says, these are the people I have seen alive. These are the people she has from childhood. Not literally the same people, but she has lived in these communities. She doesn't want to uh, think about them, but she does think about them. Today, I don't want to think of Amrit and Arun and Gunwant Singh nor of Faguni and Kalyan. So these are the people, these are maybe the friends uh, from her childhood, uh, from different communities. The names show that they are from different communities, Hindus and Sikhs, uh, different religions. She doesn't want to think about the way they were together at that time, the way they were together in the past and the way they have turned on themselves against each other. They have turned into enemies in the present. She doesn't want to think about the past because the past would remind her of the present, the way the tragedy of the present where the friends who, who used to be friends have turned into enemies now. And she doesn't want to think about the present because the present is so tragic and so horrifying. So she tries to find solace in routine, right? I have made up my mind today. Today, I have made up my mind. Today, I'll write. In peacock greenish sea green ink, I'll write. Poems about everything else. I'll think of the five Americans who made it to Annapurna without Sherpa help. I won't think of him. I'll get my homework done. So here she tries to find solace in routine, in work. And this is the first time where it is an affirmative rather than a negative that was there, it, that, that uh, you know, that was emphasized in the first three paragraphs. Here it is an affirmative. I will do. Today I will write. She will escape, right? She will escape and search for inspiration for her poetry, for her, for her art elsewhere. So she says she would talk about other events like five American women who climbed Annapurna. Annapurna is a mountain, the 10th highest peak in Nepal and this is an incredible feat because the five women who did uh, who climbed up Annapurna uh, did it with the help of the Sherpa. The Sherpas are the ethnic tribe of mountaineers in Nepal so they would guide the uh, these mountain climbers but these five women have done it without the help of the Sherpa. So in, in itself it is an incredible feat and she says that I will find she insists and she for, she's trying to force herself, her mind, her consciousness to look at this, this other news that exists. But it is, it is like, you know, when she's focusing on this news of five Americans who made it to Annapurna, it is, it is a part of her denial, her stubborn denial and a search for something else that is inspiring, but it does not really work, right? It does not re really work. And one is immediately struck by insignificance of such achievements when, when it is put in contrast, when, it's, when it is seen in contrast to the bloodshed and loss of life that is happening in India at the time. So this incredible feat of 
five women uh, who made it to Annapurna becomes becomes insignificant. It it does not seem very significant when one looks at the tragedy unfolding in India at the time. Uh, so immediately when after she says that uh, I will think of these women, she ends up saying, I won't think of hemorrhaging trains. I'll get my homework done. Why does this line come up? Because hemorrhaging trains are not far away from this mind. This focus on, she's forcing, she's suppressing uh, thinking about the present. She's suppressing the trauma of the present. But it comes back, repeatedly it comes back. Even when she's trying to do something else, even when she's trying to think of something else, the trauma catches her unaware. So the hemorrhaging trains intrude in the mind, but she pulls herself back, back firmly and says, I'll get my homework done. So notice also the, the alliteration here, peacock green, greenish, sea green, you know, the way the minutely, the way she's describing the ink in detail as if she's trying to forcefully uh, put herself, immerse herself in the present, in the task at hand, think of this news, look at the color of the ink, don't think of hemorrhaging trains, don't think of dead men and women or the photographs in the newspaper. So it doesn't, uh, by size of five, she seems to realize that it is not working. Now, instead of completing this poem, which poem is this? This poem about five American women who made it to Annapurna without Sherpa help. So instead of completing this poem about five Americans, I'm drawing Emily Franz. Now, Emily is Tamarind, right? Tamarind Franz. So I'm drawing Emily Franz all over this page and thinking of Amrit when we were six. So Emily Franz, what she's drawing, right? So we have another example. So poetry is one form of art. She's trying to immerse herself. But then she finds herself drawing Emily fronds. Now, these fronds are another form of art, right? Uh, she's drawing it, so art. But then again, uh, art unconsciously is linked to the traumatic events, her memories. Because why is she drawing Emily fronds? Because these fronds remind her of her friend Amrit when they were six. So art, even when it tries to turn away, uh, trauma intrudes, memory intrudes. So even when she's thinking about five Americans, she cannot help. Uh, she tries to push away the images, but even when she's saying that I won't think of hemorrhaging trains, but the way she's describing the trains, so evocatively hemorrhaging trains, uh, hemorrhaging is a very evocative image. You feel like, you know, trains, but at the same time, it conjures up images of bloodshed, uh, violence, so even when she turns away, she is clearly thinking about it when she describes the trains of this adjective. Similarly, even when she turns away and tries to concentrate and, you know, she's kind of doodling on the paper, what she is drawing is linked to this trauma, is linked to these, what, the events of history. So I'm thinking of Amrit when we were six beneath the Imli tree, right? That's why she is drawing Imli because even when she's suppressing the memories of Amrit, it kind of intrudes and she ends up unconsciously, the trauma comes up unconsciously and she try, she's drawing Imli fronds because they used to play under the Imli tree, right? They were friends, neighbor one, and neighbors since he was sick and we know that he's a sick boy. When we, it's because here, yeah, thinking of Ramrath when we were sick, six, uh, beneath the Imli tree, his long hair just washed, just washed, just as long as my hair just washed. So they both had long hair. So he's a sick boy and sick who do not cut their hair. They put them up in a turban. So Amrit's hair is as long as the poet's. Amrit's hair is as long as a poet's and the mothers in the mornings after washing their long hair would send the children out to play together and to dry their hair in the sun. So she remembers a time when both of them would play together under the Imli tree.
Uh, and so in she ends with saying these two lines. Now, instead of completing this poem, again, this poem is a poem about five Americans. So instead of completing this poem, I'm thinking of Amrit, right? She ends up composing the poem about Amrit. She ends up composing a poem which she did not want to write. And that's why, as I said earlier, it's a poem that she does not want to write. It's a poem that is not, she does not set out to write and she writes unconsciously, right? It is as if the art unconsciously responds to the tragedy of history. Art cannot help but respond to the tragedy of history. So the poem is not complete. Now, instead of completing this poem, right? This poem is this poem about five Americans. Is It's not a complete poem. She's trying, she's given up trying to compose that poem. I'm thinking of Amrit, right? This poem, 9th, 3rd November 1984, is actually a thought, right? Where it, she's thinking about her friend, thinking about memories of childhood and friendship, which are in such contrast to the present, which are almost tainted by the bloodshed in the present riots. Maybe she's brooding over what happened to him. Maybe she, she's thinking about how the two communities whose life were tied so intricately together, uh, to get intricately uh, together, can now have now turned against each other. Maybe she's trying to make sense and work out how did such events come to pass. Maybe she's looking for some answers in her childhood. Yeah, so, but the main thing is this response of the poem of art to history. So the poem itself is, is, an, is an unwilling, involuntary response to history as if art cannot help but respond to history. But within the poem, we also see when she's drawing Emily Fromm's, she did not set out to draw them. She's almost drawing them unconsciously. And these, these, these doodles on the page are actually linked to her unconscious, suppressed thoughts that are again responding to the present. So coming uh, to the poetic techniques of the of the of the poem, uh, the poem in itself, uh, there is allusion. The poem alludes to Sikh riots, anti-Sikh riots in 1984 in India. It also alludes to the news. So it's basically alludes to the news around surrounding this particular date. So the Sikh riots, also the five Americans who made it to who, who climbed the Annapurna. So she is uh, so there is this we see as it we can see it read it as an allusion also notice the alliteration there as or alliteration and the two important adjectives in the in stanza of four so alliteration as i said an important adjective peacock greenish sea green ink it's very peculiar the way she describes the ink uh it is in such a minute detail uh, maybe she's insisting, uh, again, it, this minute description, this preoccupation with the color of the ink shows the attempt of the poet to turn her mind away from the events and dwell on inconsequential things like the color of the ink. But it is in direct contrast to another, I think, very interesting adjective here, hemorrhaging trains, right? And the trains are, it is also an example of personification. The trains are hemorrhaging right so they are burning there is bloodshed there is violence uh, so the trains in themselves the hemorrhaging trains become a symbol of riots and somehow it, these two adjectives in stanza four stand in contrast to each other the beauty of the uh, ink and the horror and the color also i think hemorrhaging trains remind me of this red brown color of blood so the beauty there and the horror in the second this personification and objective thing. So I think that's uh, the poem is, as I said, it is about how art, even if the artist doesn't want it, is tied to history. The moment of its composition, the history permeates the even, the moment of its composition permeates through the uh, throughout the poem, uh, the poem itself, the Emily Franz, 
or respond to the historical even that she wants to suppress in her mind. But she, the more she tries to suppress, the more it comes into her art. So memory and emotions are arising out of everyday things like newspaper reports, which are very impersonal, but they become personalized in art, right? So that is important thing that art cannot first, art cannot help but respond to the events, but art also personalizes impersonal events like, you know, the riots happening. She is in America at the time, right? So she, the riot and the riots are happening in India. There is a vast distance, geographical distance, but then with thoughts, with memories and with emotions, something that is happening on the other side of the world becomes deeply personal. So the poem also, art also personalizes history. Uh, like here we see the sick riots are individualized, personalized, and we, you know, she even gives names. I know these people, I've seen them alive. And then you have names here, Amrit and Arun and Gunwant Singh and Faguni and Kalyan. So all these people she has remembered. So these people, the Im images in newspaper are no longer nameless uh, for people being killed, but someone whom the poem poet remembered. So though she's cosmopolitan, diasporic, she's living on the other side of the world, she cannot help but respond. Even when she tries to detach herself, I will not think about it. Today, I do not want to think about it. It is not, she, even when she tries to detach herself, it is not because she does not care, but because she cares too much. You know, she, these events affect her so much and that is what the poem shows. So this poem and also 29 April 19, 1989, they show how poet how poetry or how art responds to reality, it responds to history. This history can be personal, like 29th April, which marks the uh, her daughter turning uh, three months. So these, the history can be personal or it can be a part of uh, larger events, it can be part of national history. But the poet and her art ex expresses a response that is deeply personal. With that, uh, we come to the end of the, uh, of the discussion on this poem. If you have any questions, you can write them on the comments, uh, in the comments below. Uh, if you want any specific poem to be discussed, you can let me know. I would go on discussing more such poems, which I find them in current, which I find in curriculum. But if there is a specific, specific poem by Sujata Bhad that you want me to discuss, I would be happy to do that. I would also be beginning, uh, soon I would be start beginning a session or a series of sessions on Jhumpa Lahiri's The Namesake. Uh, please, keep a, please keep an eye on the channel and see you soon. Bye-bye.